Well, good evening. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, a second one of the ways of Christ. Uh, in this series, as we've been going through, we're looking at different things that Jesus built into his life that were regular practices of his. Um, if our goal is to be like Jesus, then we need to do the things that Jesus did. Um, there are times that we modify it. It changes based on being in different cultures, like we don't go to the temple anymore. We don't offer sacrifices like Jesus would have. It's because we know the reason it's changed. He is our sacrifice once and for all. Uh, the sacrifices in the Old Testament pointed to him. But there are things that he did that are common to all of humanity. Uh, last week, we talked about the Sabbath and how it was a reg regular rhythm built into uh, God's people's lives. One day out of every seven was devoted to them learning the lessons of the Sabbath. And so, as Christians, we can't just move past that and say, well, it doesn't apply to us anymore, so we don't really have anything to learn. Likewise, tonight, we're going to talk about something that is almost equally as foreign to us in our culture, which is a very speedy, non-stop, never a dull moment type of culture, and that is called solitude. Uh, the idea of being alone in some way, of silence, of quiet. Now, if we think about solitude, you may think about uh, walks down nature trails that you've been on when you get separated from the group and there's distance between you and you can no longer hear them. You can hear the birds, you can hear the squirrel that sounds like it's a fox running towards you, sounds like it's way bigger than it really is, and then you see it come out of a, from behind a bush and it's just a cute little critter. You have things like that where you, you're alone, you experience solitude, but we don't really think about it in terms of something that we really seek out as much as maybe some people used to. Solitude, go 100, 200 years ago, really from the time of the Industrial Revolution on, but go before that, solitude was something that almost every human being would have experienced multiple times throughout their days for extended times throughout their days. We, we weren't always together. We weren't always rushing from one thing to the other. There was no movie screens. There was no places to be. It was you got up, you were that day, you went to bed, you got up, you worked for your living for that day. You went to bed. And in <clears throat> interspersed throughout that would have been times that you came together with people, whether around the, uh, a meal at night, around a campfire. There were things that were entertainment, so to say, but it wasn't in your pocket and on constant demand. It would have been in the form of a traveling storyteller who would roam around from campfire to campfire, city to city, and tell stories. It would be in the form of bards or musicians that would come into towns to play and sing songs. But the practice of being alone was something that I don't think was quite as foreign as it is to us. Uh, and it's not just the practice of being alone, it's the practice of solitude, because you and I can be entirely alone and yet still just constantly have things demanding our attention. And so, tonight, I want us to take time to ask the question, why should we have what often has been called maybe a quiet time, um, though it may look a little different than what sometimes we say a quiet time is, uh, a time alone, solitude. And I want us to think about it in terms of it being a relational thing. You take me and Rebecca, for example. I know how quickly it can happen that you have kids, responsibilities, jobs, uh, whatever else may come your way, that it can be very easy to neglect spending time alone with Rebecca, going on a date, going to do something with each other. It can be so easy to allow all of these things, even things that we are doing together, that can rob us from actually having time where it's just me and her. You know, when you start off a relationship, that's what your goal is. You want time with just that person because they're your special person you're pursuing and wanting to know more about and get closer to. And so 
you look forward to those times that those people uh, around you kind of walk away and you get to have those conversations that are more discussing what your heart is going towards and what their heart is going towards. But as you get married and you have all these responsibilities that come up and that demand things of you, it can be very easy to just kind of let that drown out that time that's very intentional in pursuing the other person. Solitude to our relationship with God is much like date night or a long time is with a couple. It's time to strip the distractions away to where at that point, who you are and the health of your relationship with that person starts to bubble up to the surface. We see this as the case when you have a couple whose children move out of their homes, they become empty nesters, and they look across the table and say, I have no idea who you are. They have forgotten to pursue each other, to love each other, to get, continually learn about who that other person is. It wasn't enough to fall in love once and to get to know that person once, but it was something that required maintenance and required you continually pursuing. Otherwise, you get to that point where you do look across the table and you don't know them. You remember who they were, but you don't know who they are. And that's very understandable to us. I think we can all think of people who have told us that that was the case. People who stayed together until their kids were in college and then they wound up getting divorced because they just weren't in love anymore, whatever the case may be. But with us and God, our time to step away from all the distractions, to be alone with Him, to let our hearts and what our hearts are saying about Him and our relationship bubble up to the surface, and to hear from Him about His love for us, those moments are how we do maintenance on our relationship with God. It's not something that can be done in the middle of community. It's something that has to be done in an intimate setting. It's something that Jesus, just to prove to you that the idea of maintaining your relationship with God is a part of the human condition, that there's no such thing as I got good with God once and then I get to move on and he's attached to me for the rest of my life, regardless of what I do with him. Jesus himself did this. It's not sinful to have to maintain a relationship with God. It's part of who we were designed to be, to constantly be pursuing him and drawing closer to him. To give you some examples, Mark chapter 1. Immediately, this is after Jesus was baptized, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, who was with the wild animals and the angels were serving him. He goes out into the wilderness to a, a desolate place to be with God. It's not the only case. And he spent 40 days. I mean, that's how he started his ministry. Like, just let that sink into you. Like, we think, okay, start my ministry, go do. You know what Jesus thought? Start my ministry, I'm going to spend this first time just being with my father. What about later? Jesus goes out. Surely he kind of got that solitude thing out of his system. And now that he's going around to people who need him, to all these people who need to be healed and who are demon possessed and who need to hear the truth of the gospel, surely now he's coming to the point to where he's going to say, okay, my real work is to be with all these people and meet every demand. And never say no. If you think that, you haven't listened to me long enough to realize I'm setting you up. Mark 1. When evening came, after the sun had set, they brought to him all those who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Then very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and went to work again and made his way to a deserted place, the same term for wilderness. He made his way out to the wilderness again, and there he was praying. So 
So he gets up and he goes out. How do people respond to him? I mean, because in this example, Jesus is not meeting the needs of those people who are coming swarming to him. He's left that town. There seems to be many more people who need to be healed. It doesn't say that he healed all of them. So, I mean, in some ways we say if he has the ability to heal them, some of us in kind of like how we think about our walk is you need to do everything for everyone you have the power to do it for. So Simon and his companions searched for him, and when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you, Jesus. Like, we got work to do, Jesus. All these people came for you. Why are you out here by yourself? Like, do you not get the ministry thing? Like, it's about you being with people, Jesus. And he said to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. I mean, as insane as this may sound, there are very clear instances where Jesus had the ability to heal someone, to wipe out sickness from a village, and he doesn't do it. He doesn't heal everyone. He doesn't cast out every demon. He doesn't accomplish everything on the to-do list. He goes off by himself to be with his father, to maintain that relationship. How many times have we seen pastors who met every need in their flock, were always on call, and wound up getting to the point in their life where their relationship with Jesus was just depleted, lifeless. They knew the motions to do, and so they did, and 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 they neglected actually being with God and knowing who He was. And I can tell you an example of this. Some of you may have heard of the book Radical by David Platt. Um, David Platt was a megachurch pastor in Birmingham, and uh, he was someone who wrote a book that became a New York Times bestseller called Radical about giving up this pursuit of the American dream and instead pursuing a radical living of trying to give everything that we had towards advancing the kingdom, to doing mission work to spreading the gospel for those who didn't know it. His book became a New York Times bestseller. His church was a mega church. He was 30-something, or no, he had his doctorate before he was 30. I mean, this is a guy that's doing everything that's like, if we were measuring success by how much he was accomplishing, he's doing it. And he said his wife came to him one day and said, I'm concerned because you seem to have no relationship with your God still. Like, and it was a shock to him. And he realized, like, I'm not spending time with God. I'm rushing from thing to thing to thing. I'm just doing and doing and doing. And I'm not actually pursuing and maintaining my relationship with my father. Uh, this is someone who I've heard him speak and talk since then. And he talks about how he has this relationship now where that's the priority. He'll even say things like, uh, God only trusts his deepest things with those who spend the most time with him. Like if you really want him to unveil the depths of his heart to you, you can't expect him to do that if you never actually spend time with him, seeking him to be quiet and alone with him. Well, maybe this is just a, a fad with Jesus. Maybe he got that, that one time in the wilderness for 40 days and he just needed like a touch-up morning and then it became something that really wasn't a part of his life. Luke 5 says, But the news about him spread even more, and large crowds would come together to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. All right, he's getting it. He's just doing, do more. Yet he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. That contrast of who Jesus was was someone who was willing to withdraw, to leave things undone so that he could actually be with his father and know him and spend time with him. Now, I get that we can all come up with excuses and say, well, I can be with God in the middle of a whole bunch of people. 
I can be with God. I don't have to go off into a wilderness to be with God. I can find God in and, you know, say whatever place we want to. I find God in church. I find God in my community group. I find God in, and we go through these things. The question to me is this. If we're just coming up with those excuses, are we really taking seriously this model that Jesus laid out for us? Because it's often those who have the excuses who don't really understand the point of what it was doing to begin with. Like, I think about when I was a kid and my parents used to tell me things that were good for me to do. And I would come up with all of the excuses about why I shouldn't have to do it. Until later, I suffered the consequences of not doing those things. You know, it's... It's one thing to learn from your own mistakes. But the wise person learns from the lesson and the model of those who are wise before them. Jesus is the epitome of wisdom. We can't take his example and chuck it. Uh, We live in a culture that demands more and more and more and more. And we praise those who are on the front edge of pushing themselves to the absolute limit until they break Until we see, it's usually not a breaking of like everything falls apart, but it usually is there's something that was deprived, that was starved, that didn't get nourished, that led to that point. I'm not saying that we can't accomplish much. We can. We can all push and do and do a lot more than what we probably think we can. The question is, Are we going to choose to trust that God's ways get God results? Because your calling and my calling is not to do more. Your calling and my calling is to trust God, to believe Him in His ways, and to pursue Him according to Him. And if we do that, we can take to heart the promises of God that says He draws near to those who draw near to Him. We can trust it. And believe it. Jesus probably disappointed a lot of people by withdrawing in the way he did. Um, there were a lot of people that were probably hoping that they could see him and that he could do something for them, and then he wound up not being able to. But he also recognized that built into the human condition is the need for us to be alone with our God to maintain that relationship. Now, Let me ask you this question. What was in the wilderness? I want to try to get into the practicalness of why we're supposed to do this. What's the benefit of it? Let me ask this question, and this is a real question. What, What was in the wilderness? Why did he go there? Okay. Quiet, no distractions, peace. Well, there was there. There was temptation. Yeah. He wasn't distracted in his own mind for him. Yeah. Okay, he's in God's creation. Yeah. I have a question also. If Jesus goes into the wilderness, who's in the wilderness? More simple than that. This is like a, I know it feels like a riddle. It's not a riddle. (laughs) Jesus goes into the wilderness. He's in the wilderness. Uh, He is alone with God. I want to point out a couple things that are there. You pointed out about God's creation. We've talked about how God reveals himself both in his creation, his act of creating, like any artist who creates a masterpiece, tells of himself. It it unveils things to us. It lets us see his heart, the heart of the creator. So going into wilderness, going into places where we are quiet and alone with God, outside in the wilderness or in nature is a great place. Like when we got to enjoy a Sunday service down in essentially a sanctuary that God built. Like, it reminds us of his creation, of who he is. 
Uh, and not just that, uh, Jesus, as someone who would have memorized and meditated on the scriptures, also went there. He probably didn't have a like book with him because books didn't exist. Uh, he probably didn't have a scroll with him because scrolls were extremely expensive and usually were only kept in very secure buildings like the temple or the synagogues. Um, very, very rich people would have them in their houses, but that was about it. So he likely took only what he remembered from God's word into this wilderness with him, which is why when he does have the temptation, you know, we're not told how long he was in the wilderness before the temptations came. Did they all come at the end of the 40 days or were they interspersed throughout the 40 days? But what we do know is that when Jesus was in the wilderness, he had the word of God with him because he had memorized it like it was in his heart. He knew it. Um, so in the wilderness, in those places where you may not have your Bible with you, uh, you may be totally alone. What you take into that is what you have soaked into your heart. And that's what the second thing I want to point out is in the wilderness is the overflow of the person's heart. Whatever you stuff into yourself, when you're in those moments where it is quiet and there's nothing to occupy your mind, is what starts bubbling back out to the surface. And so the point of that is, I mean, we read in Luke 6, a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit, and on the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit, for each tree is known by its fruit. A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For him. The mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. And this is true when we are alone with God and there's no distractions. There's no inflowing river that's kind of stifling the outflow of our heart. Instead, in that moment, the only thing that's flowing out is what's coming out of our heart. And we realize a lot of things about ourselves in that moment. Uh, the constant way that we just constantly pour into ourselves, even with good things, podcasts, when we listen to music, things that are entertainment like TV shows, movies, a lot of times can be kind of a coping mechanism where you and I have not really dealt with something that's troubling us and unsettling to us. And instead of dealing with it, we numb ourselves through surrounding ourselves with things, just like when a couple numbs themselves to the harm and the hurt between them by surrounding themselves with good things to do. We go to church, we go to the serve event, we go to this kid's game, we go to all these other things, uh, we go on vacations, we go to whatever the case may be. We can surround and fill ourselves with things that allow us to become numb to the, the harm that's growing in that relationship. And when you and I go and we are alone with God and our heart starts bubbling up and our God starts speaking to us, there may be some hard conversations that happen in those moments. But no marriage survives without hard conversations. And no child of God grows closer to his God without those hard conversations. And so, we have so much that we use to kind of distract ourselves. It's why it's a practice that probably feels totally foreign to us to even consider. Time to say, I'm not going to have any inputs, no TV, no music, other than what God has created, N no shows, no podcast, no reading, no pulling in. This is going to be a moment where I'm going to have my heart and God's heart meet and it may expose some things about it, my heart, to me that just show me how I need to grow and work as a person. As we look at the ways of Jesus, uh, some of these we're naturally going to have no desire to really do. Uh, this may be one of them. When we look at Jesus regularly practicing something like this, and then we look at our own hearts, and our hearts are walled off against it. It may be revealing something to us about our own heart that we need to take into consideration. And that may be recognizing that the flaw with it is not the way that Jesus practiced. The flaw is we have to change in some way to be more like Jesus. 
And so let's spend some time just praying. Uh, just however you want to respond to this, talking to your father, um, pray to him. Uh, pour out your heart, bear your heart to him. Uh, let this kind of be a precursor to us actually putting this into practice and trying to spend time alone with our God to know him and to be known by him. Father, we need time with you to hear from you, to let you search our hearts. Uh, you know, as I was preparing this, I even thought about how many of the psalms that David wrote came out of him sitting out in fields, just being with you, dwelling on who you were and who he was to you. Psalm 23 seems like a perfect example of him just sitting in a field and thinking about how you were his shepherd. Father, if that's the type of depth that can come from being along with you, to just not just a place where our heart overflows to you, but then for you to meet us and to fill us so that we may overflow and bless those in community when we go back to them. That you can cause our hearts to be full so that we can, with what you've given us, then give to others. Then, Father, help us to develop this practice of being along with you, of being in solitude with you to know you, to love you, to be made more like your son. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we're going to pray for uh, quiet, that we would make time to be alone with God, to hear from Him, and to meditate on our relationship with Him. And that we would develop our abilities to pull away from distractions and entertainment to prioritize our relationships. Confront. That we would deal with the condition of our own hearts and to maintain our growth, not growing complacent. That God would meet us in our brokenness to bring healing and peace to our souls. And then tonight we're going to pray for our children uh, who are in the church that we would be grateful for the kids God has provided to our church and be good stewards of the time we have with them. And that God would help us to walk holy lives in front of them to communicate that the gospel is true. And that. And you can fill in the blank for whatever you want to.
and we know that you are worth pursuing and drawing close to. We know that you are worth uh, giving up time and other things and what may seem uh, in our modern productivity mindset to be uh, better things to spend our time on. Um, But Father, what is more worth pursuing than being closer to you and being more shaped into your image? One man who followed your ways and was close to you with no division, who sought you faithfully, who constantly maintained that relationship with you, Father, he changed the world more than any of us ever will. Help us to quit believing the lies that productivity, efficiency, doing more, producing more is what ultimately wins the day. Father, it is us drawing near to you. It's what you designed us for. It's what you made us for. And we are restless until we do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.